And we welcome you to this Wednesday evening service here at the Victory Baptist Church. And we call this Wednesdays in the Word. And we're so happy that you've joined us for this first Wednesday in the month of May. And uh, we're delighted to come and bring this live stream service to all of our members and those who watch us faithfully and who are listening in each and every week. <clears throat> We've had folks from uh, so far from 12 different states that have uh, listened to our online services and a good number of friends, of course, in the South and Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, and different places like that. So we're grateful for your faithfulness and the encouraging words that we're receiving regarding our Facebook live stream services. And uh, <clears throat> we've had a meeting today with a Zoom meeting with a group of local pastors, and we are uh, just making decisions about what to do here in our state of New Hampshire. Of course, our governor has <clears throat> said that um, given the stay-home order until the end of May, and uh, but many churches around our country are reopening and are having services. I don't like to use the, the term reopening because we've not been closed uh, we've had services, live stream services, parking lot services, and uh, but we're going to eventually have a service to where we can worship inside again, inside our auditorium here, and we're looking at May the 31st being our target date, <clears throat> and so be in prayer about that, and we will uh, certainly give you a more definitive answer about that in, in days to come. And uh, we have an audience with our governor uh, this week, one of our local pastors, and uh, will be a representative for us uh, speaking to the governor and and uh, about the importance of e churches <clears throat> being essential and also not uh, overstepping our constitutional rights to, uh, of freedom of religion. There's a fine line here, and we're trying to do our very best to use wisdom and uh, as we minister uh, to our community. And may the Lord bless and help us as we do that. And uh, this is our Wednesday evening service, and we like to... Uh, I certainly take a time for prayer, and we've had a good number of folks uh, call in and thanking us for praying for their special needs last week. And I want you to pray for <clears throat> Lori Grant, one of our church members who just requested prayer. She's homesick, and uh, please uh, remember her in your prayers. And all those in our that serve uh, in nursing homes and who serve in hospitals and who serve in um, home care and health care, uh, industry. <clears throat> We're praying for their protection and uh, for those who are exposed uh, to the coronavirus for their healing and protection. And so uh, they're more at risk than most of us, and so we're praying for these. And we have a good a good many at our church who are working each and every day with uh, people who have been infected. So let's pray for God's protection for His people and for healing, certainly. And uh, <clears throat> we have a missionary of the week. His name is Paul Daycue. Brother Paul and Martha have been longtime missionaries here at Victory Baptist Church, serving the Lord in the Fiji Islands, and had a good conversation with Brother Daycue this past week and what the Lord is doing there. <clears throat> and as we pray tonight, I want you to remember him in your prayers as well as our uh, highlighted missionary of the week. Uh, we discussed in our missions conference back in November that this year, 2020, uh, we would have four projects that we're going to be giving mission money to, and this was one of them, one of them, uh, Brother Paul Dacu and his wife, uh, Martha, uh, pastor the Grace Bible Baptist Church, and I can't pronounce the name of the city, but it's spelled L-A-U-O-T-O-K-A, -O 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 Fiji Islands. And uh, he's been there a long time, and he has trained a man and sent out from that church to start another church about an hour away, uh, and they've uh, named this the Solid Rock Baptist Church, and they've been meeting for quite some time now, several years, and they have property, and they just have been approved for a brand new building project, and I have before me here the, the plans, uh, <clears throat> beautiful plans, that pre-approved plans for their building, and um they're trying to raise sixty-five thousand uh, dollars to build this building, and uh, he has written letters to all his supporting churches and uh, asking for a generous gift. And so we have certainly committed some mission money uh, towards our longtime missionary. And Brother Dave Roy, our treasurer, will be sending out the check this week and uh, to give a generous offering to help in uh, the building of this new church plant. 
And I'm thankful for God's people here at Victory Baptist Church who have given sacrificially uh, each and every week, each and every Sunday to support missions around the world. And God has given us a mandate to take the gospel into all the world, not just our Jerusalem here in Londonderry, which we have so many uh, hooks in the water that we're trying to give the gospel to in our area, but we also have a Judea, a Samaria, and we have the uttermost parts of the earth. And so pray for our missionary of the week, and he uh, related to me on the phone to be sure to give the folks at Victory Baptist his appreciation for the generous love offering <clears throat> out of our mission fund, and we thank God for that. And if you have any other special requests, please call us or call me, call our church office, email us, and we want to know about how we can pray for you in a better way. Also pray for Sally Anderson, one of our shut-in ladies <clears throat> at a nursing home, and pray for Sylvia Hunter and Hunter, a good friend of hers, and many others uh, who are seeking to minister to those who are shut-ins. Sylvia Hunter, one of our uh, ladies who serves in our ministry here, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> has um, recently decided to send a letter, a mail, a mailing a letter, a card uh, to all the folks at Bentley Commons in, uh, Bed in Bedford. Uh, we have a nursing home service there every Tuesday <clears throat> and uh, at 2.30. And uh, we've, of course, all of our nursing home ministries have been shut down, and we're unable to go into the nursing homes because of this national emergency pandemic. Uh, but we do love our residents at Bentley Commons and those at All American in Londonderry, those at Villa Crest in Manchester, um, and many others. And so we're just praying that God would continue to watch over the senior citizens. <clears throat> and our new one in Manchester as well. And uh, Miss Sylvia Hunter is going to be sending cards from our church, uh, from the pastor, from Victory Baptist Church, uh, to those who attend our services at, at uh, Bentley Commons, and uh, just as a way to, to keep in touch and to remain uh, an encouragement to those in the nursing home. So pray for that today as well. And let's ask God's blessing on these special requests and that God might work in our lives. And pray for the pastors in our area, uh, that God would give wisdom and discernment as we seek to move forward and push back, if necessary, uh, to our government. But uh, we need to start assembling again in the near future uh, as others, places of our country are opening back, opening back up. So pray that God would give us wisdom as we move forward from this. Father, bless now, we pray, the... <clears throat> season of prayer. We thank you that we can bring our requests before you, and we thank you for the divine invitation that we have to come boldly before the throne of grace. And we pray, Lord, for those in our church that work on the front lines, hospitals, and health care, that you might be with them, guard them, protect them, bring healing to those who've been exposed, and we just pray especially that you would work in their lives. I pray to for <clears throat> Sylvia Hunter t tonight that you might be with her as she seeks to minister to those shut-ins. And thank you, Lord, for the good job she's doing. And I pray for Sally Anderson and others, Brother Ron Ariel and others who are shut-in and at this time that you might be with them. And for our church here <clears throat> and so many needs that we have, we pray for our missionary of the week, Brother Day Q, that you might use the money that we've sent to help further the gospel and that souls may be saved there in the Fiji Islands. And we rejoice in what you're going to do. And bless us tonight in this uh, meeting and this Wednesdays in the Word. Use the message you've given me to encourage the hearts of people. Use the music that we selected to also to be an encouragement and uplifting to the saints of God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen <clears throat> and amen. Well, as we normally do, I want to sing a few songs. And uh, this is an old song that was made popular uh, by <clears throat> Lester Roloff. And he sang this song all over the country. And uh, it's called The Sun's Coming Up in the Morning. And uh, we may face battles and trials each day, but we know that <clears throat> uh, when it's over, uh, that there's victory that we have in Christ. Once again I face Satan this morning And I battled him 
all the day long. But in my weakness, God sent reinforcement. And at sundown, I sang victory song. And the sun's coming up in the morning. Every tear will be gone from my eye. This old clay gonna give way to glory and like an eagle I'll take to the sky in a world filled with doubt and confusion it's so hard when you don't understand but I'm standing on a solid foundation and I'm holding to an unchanging hand and the sun's coming up in the morning every tear will be gone from my eye this old clay's gonna give way to glory and like an eagle I'll take to the sky and like an eagle I'll take to the sky amen well, there's one more I want to sing, and uh, this has kind of been a signature song for me, as uh, <clears throat> that particular song was for, De for Lester Roloff. I've uh, kind of adopted this song. I had cancer 11 years ago, and uh, sometime shortly after that episode in my life of, of illness, I put together a uh, CD, a singing music CD, and this was the theme song on that CD. And it's entitled, God's Been Good <clears throat> in My Life. Lately I've been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. Though it may sound simple, it's more than a cliché. There's no other words to tell you than to say, God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, by my side He's always stood through it all. God's been good. Replays and I can see I've cried some bitter tears, but I felt his arms around me as I faced my darkest fears. I've had more gains than losses, I've no more joy than hurt as his grace rolled down upon me undeserved. God's been I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, by my side He's always stood. Cause through it all, God's been good. God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. 
His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. I could spend forever trying to tell you everything He is. But the best way I can say it is this. God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Cause through it all, God's been good. Through it all. God's been good. Amen. All right, I hope that song is a blessing to you as it has been to me. And uh, not sure who wrote the song, but <clears throat> and whoever wrote it wrote a good one. And uh, it's blessed and touched so many people, those who know it and sing it. And I want to give you just a few thoughts as we continue this series, Wednesdays in the Word, uh, as we look uh, tonight at the book of Psalms. We've been uh, speaking on selections from the Psalms. And going to have Brother Josh Barnes uh, preach again in one of these uh, Wednesdays and Brother Drew Brock once again, and we have a few of these Wednesdays left. But I want to take uh, tonight uh, and speak from the book of Psalms, the 32nd chapter. And I want to read all these verses <coughs> and give you a few thoughts on the subject of contentment in Christ. Contentment in Christ. And uh, certainly people today are looking for satisfaction, for contentment. And we know as Christians, the only place we can find true contentment is in the Lord Jesus Christ. David knew this. He writes to us in Psalm 32, verse 1 through verse 11. Blessed or blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And when I kept silence... My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. Notice David is referring to his conviction here uh, when he sinned in 1 Samuel chapter 11. He says, my, uh, Thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the draught of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin unto thee and mine iniquity, have I not hid? I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the, the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Verse 6, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me with, about with songs of deliverance. And that's a special verse here uh, out of all the verses, these 11 verses in Psalm 32. Uh, that's certainly a verse that many can ought to claim right now for your healing and for your uh, preservation and for God's touch in your life. I'll read it again. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Uh, then the Bible speaks about two animals here. Be not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Of course, the horse is a great symbol of speed, and the mule is a symbol of stubbornness. <laughs> And it seems like if we're not careful as Christians, we can be guilty of going one way or the other, either getting too far ahead of God as uh, the horse and are dragging behind and being stubborn in our will and our ways as the mule. Uh, but the Bible goes on to say, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, 
all ye that are upright in heart. And we're talking here about contentment in Christ. And uh, I read the story this week about uh, a man that was <clears throat> certainly not content with the house he was living in. And uh, he realized some of his friends had a more luxurious house houses that, than he had. And so he became dissatisfied and discontented about it. And so he listed his house in the real estate market and got a realtor and and uh, he wanted to sell his home and find a bigger, better home. And uh, shortly afterwards, he was reading the classified section of the newspaper, and he saw an ad, not with a picture, but just an ad with wording. And, and he read the ad, and he said, this is just the house I'm looking for. And so he promptly called the realtor and said, a house that's been described in today's paper is exactly what I'm looking for. And I want you to go through and uh, make an offer on it as soon as possible for me. And the real estate agent uh, said back to him, but sir, that's that's your house that you're describing. That's the ad that I put in the paper for your house. And though that's a humorous thing, it seems like the man wasn't satisfied with what he had. And that humorous story reminds me that there's so many people today that are not satisfied with what they have in life. They're not con truly contented. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. And if you want to be someone who's truly blessed in your life, godliness comes first, contentment comes second, and great gain comes through the process. And so may God help us to see that. There's an old country song that says, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces. And uh, the problem with that country song is that genuine contentment that we're talking about tonight is not found in physical or material things or people. It's not found in dollar bills and possessions that we have. But real contentment uh, for the Christian life comes from our heart. It comes from Christ, the Lord Jesus living in our heart. And uh, leaning upon Him day by day. That's real contentment. And uh, can't be found in what we possess, but it can be found in who we possess. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, or if any man be in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And there's a new peace, a new joy, a new purpose, a new contentment that comes by being in Christ and having Christ in you. And that's what I'm talking about uh, in this uh, psalm tonight. And so I want you to see, first of all, the possibility of spiritual contentment. Now, just give a little bit of background about Psalm 32. Uh, this was written, of course, by David after he committed adultery with, uh, with Bathsheba. And uh, he had, of course, you can read the story in First, Second Samuel chapter 11. And after he was in a wrong place at the wrong time, when other kings went forth to battle, David sent Joab. David remained in a place where he should not have been. He looked upon a woman that was not his wife. He lusted after her. He sent for her, sent for her. He committed adultery with her. He found out about her husband and Uriah, brought him to the forefront of the battle, <coughs> had him killed, married Bathsheba, had the baby, tried to cover all of that up. And the very latter part of Second, Second Samuel chapter 11, I think one of the latter verses says, And this thing that David had done displeased the Lord. What thing? Well, the matter of covering up his sins. And when David is speaking in Psalm 32, when he says, Mine iniquity have I not hid, <coughs> he's talking here about his confession in Psalm 51. David finally came clean. And we know the story when uh, he unsuccessfully tried to cover up his sin. And by the way, all of us can do several things. We can attempt to justify our sin, as so many do, make excuses for it. Saul, the king, first king of Israel, uh, he, he gave a reason why he disobeyed uh, the prophet Samuel. And Samuel said to obey is better than to sacrifice. So many justify their sin. So many try to cover up their sin in some way, form, or fashion. 
Uh, and sometimes we want to blame our sins on others. You know, Adam said, the woman thou gavest me causeth me to eat. Uh, so many times we uh, want to shift the blame and pass the buck, so to speak. But here David comes clean in Psalm 51. And uh, he's confronted by Nathan the prophet back in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And, and uh, he confesses. He pays for his sin fourfold. He pronounces the judgment that he has to live under. And, of course, Psalms 51 is written, and a full confession of sin is given, and a request for forgiveness. As he says in Psalm 51, he prays that God might restore unto him the joy of his salvation, and that he might create in him a clean heart again, O Lord, and a right spirit again. He speaks about broken, broken bones, and that they may rejoice again. And so, and he promises that when he's forgiven, that he will to open his lips again, and he will, begin, he will begin to teach sinners in the way of righteousness. And so Psalm 32, our psalm before us tonight, seems to be David's fulfillment of that promise. And uh, as he is uh, uh, relaying and contemplating on the forgiveness that he experienced. So we do see here the possibility of contentment. David was a great singer. We know that. David was a great soldier. We know that. David was a great sovereign king. We know that. But also David was a great sinner. And this great sinner uh, ought to teach us something about our sin. Paul even said about himself, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. And you and I ought to feel about the same way in our life. We are all of us, but for the grace of God, there go I. And there's no telling what you and I could do uh, when we give <clears throat> a, a submission to our fallen nature. There's no telling what de degrading, de depraved sin we could, e each of us, any of us could be involved in if it were not for the grace of God and God's keeping as we yield ourselves to Him. And so I want you to see the possibility of spiritual contentment. We see spiritual contentment is defined here. And notice that David uses four different words <clears throat> to describe his own failure. And these four words you and I deal with. And the first word we find in verse number one is the word transgressions. Notice he says, whose blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Notice that. That word transgression means to go across a boundary. It means to cross the line. Uh, we have in our hands, I have in my hand tonight, a copy of God's Word. This is God's inspired, inerrant, infallible truth of God's Word. And God's Word tells me how to live as a Christian. God's Word speaks to me. I have convictions based upon and grounded upon and settled in my heart and mind based on what God's Word says about that. And I can make a choice. I can fall in line and submit myself to God's Word and live by the principles and precepts of God's Word, or I can cut across the grain. I can transgress. I can go across the boundary. I can cross the line uh, and transgress. It kind of has the idea of a when you come upon a crime scene and the police officers have barricaded everything off and there's a there's a, there's a caution, there's a tape there. And when someone breaks that barricade, when they, when they cross over in a place they should not be, they've transgressed. It has the same mindset here. David is talking about the word transgression here is meaning an open rebellion. <coughs> in other words, we know the line is there. We see the line. Uh, we, we see the boundary. But yet willingly we disobey what we know is wrong. We have transgressed God's Word. Uh, it's, it has to do with defiance. And it's almost like when we tell our children, our teenagers, now, this is the rule. Th this, this is the guideline. And if you break the rule, if you, if you miss the curfew, if you break the rules, if you uh, perform an act of disobedience, there's consequences. And uh, sometimes young people... Uh, knowing where the boundary is, knowing where the line is not to cross, they still cross over. 
And we have to let them know there are consequences. And God lets us know as Christians when we cross the line, when we transgress God's word, there are consequences. And David knew that and experienced that. Then he talks about sin. He says, and uh, whose sin is covered. Now, either you can try to cover your sin and I can try to cover my sin, or we can let God cover our sin. I choose the latter. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And dear friend, uh, that's how all of us ought to do is, is let God cover your sins with the precious blood of Christ. And that word sin, if Transgression means to cut across the boundary. Sin means has the idea of missing the mark. Missing the mark. It's like a bent arrow or a crooked arrow that when you shoot it, it won't fly straight. And you and I, we sin. We miss the mark. We aim for perfection, but we don't hit it. And none of us, all of us fall short of the glory of God. And so this pictures sin. And then a third word is used, and that word is found in verse Number two, blessed is the man unto, the, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And that word has, means crooked or bent. It brings to mind that our nature as sinners, we are warped, we are distorted. We have a bend toward evil. Uh, I spent most of my uh, <coughs> time, my wife and I, raising our children to do right, because it seemed like wrong comes automatically. I could give you personal illustrations to this, but not to belabor the point, but the fact of the matter is when we raise children, we don't teach them to do wrong. We teach them to do right, because wrong comes automatically. And uh, I remember a time when I came through the living room and, and had asked my son to take the garbage out before he got involved in a certain program and or game there and he said he would and I came through a little time later and found out that <clears throat> I asked him did you take out the trash and he said yes <coughs> and kept playing the game or watching the program whatever it was and I went out and noticed that the garbage can was not taken by the road he lied about that to keep doing what he was doing he told a fib told a lie now where did he learn that from he didn't learn that from us he not from my side of the family, at least. He learned that from his mother's side of the family. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But that comes natural. And so all of us have to deal with our own sinful nature. We have a bend towards lying and towards uh, iniquity in all shapes and forms. And then guile. Think about this word guile. The Bible says uh, in verse number 2, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Guile is half-truth. You, know, you know, some people today would rather climb a tree <laughs> and tell a lie than to stand on solid ground and tell the truth. And uh, they would rather go out of their way to lie than to just be honest about something. And sometimes it's not just an outright lie that's a problem. It's guile. It's telling a half-truth. It's, for example, these books behind me, if someone were to come in and say, if a young person were to come into my office and say, Pastor, have you read all, have you read all of those books? And if I said to them, some of, some of them I've read twice. That's guile. I didn't answer the question. I gave an impression that I've not only read all of them, but I've read most of them twice. That's guile. And uh, I should say, no, I haven't read all of those books, but some I've read, and some I've read twice. But all of us are guilty of telling a half-truth. We're guilty of painting something in a certain way to where it makes us look good or it doesn't quite deal with truth. And preachers especially have to guard against this about <clears throat> telling stories and illustrations that, uh, to where we embellish things and, and uh, gives people the impression that we're full of guile. This is a sin that's, that pictures deception. Deception. We're deceiving others to think a certain way about something uh, when this is guile, it's untruth. And so David talks about these four things. Uh, but getting your sin and my sin dealt with before the Lord is the key to spiritual contentment. So 
All of us deal with what David dealt with. I deal with tra- my own transgression, my own sin, my own iniquity, my own guile. I'm guilty of all four. So are you. But the key to spiritual contentment is dealing, having these things dealt with. And David says his transgression can be forgiven. Did you see that? Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. Uh, In other words, that word means to lift up and to bear it. And God can remove, He can lift it up and bear our sins. And our transgressions can be forgiven. Our sin can be covered. Uh, It can be put out of sight. And by the way, when God does forgive your sin and cover your sin, don't you go and take the covers off and keep reminding God of something He's forgiven you of. And sometimes we just need to move forward, as Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, and we press toward the mark that's before us. And some things have been forgiven, they're under the blood, God's forgotten about it, and you ought to forget about it and move forward and not let the devil use our past uh, to rob us of future spiritual victory. Blessed is a man whose sin is covered. And the Bible says our iniquity can be imputed. <clears throat> uh, it's, it means this debt can be reckoned, imputed. How can we reckon that debt? By our own righteousness? No, no. But the righteousness of Christ can be imputed to us. I'm not going to heaven on my own works. I'm going on His work, what He did at Calvary. Uh, The finished work of Christ, His imputed righteousness was put on my account, put on your account if you're a Christian. You're not going to heaven on your own merit, and neither am I. But I'm going to heaven on the merit of one greater than I, the Lord Jesus. I've received by faith what Jesus did for me on the cross. I've received His payment for my sin. And I've been imputed, His righteousness has been imputed to mine account. Our heart can be free of guile. Notice, free. We can be free from spiritual deception. And we can live an honest Christian life and be truthful. And when we speak something, people don't have to second guess what we're saying or call somebody to see if you're telling the truth. But when we speak something, people know... From our mouth comes truth. And that's the kind of Christian all of us should strive to be. And so spiritual contentment is <coughs> possible. It's definitely possible. And uh, when our heart becomes clean, there's a possibility of contentment. And David not only had experienced the depths of sin, but he also experienced the heights of the grace of God in his life. And so we see there. And... Uh, the, the possibility. Then I'll just say, secondly, the path to spiritual contentment. You know, David tells us about a process here. And so many of us want, we want contentment in our life. We, we desire to be fulfilled and satisfied. We want to be content through life. We want the product, but not the process. David tells us a process by with, a path by with and wherewith we can obtain spiritual contentment. And I hate to mention this, the first one, but it's here in God's Word. And the first process, the first path is, David talks about the step of chastisement. Chastise. Notice verse 3 and verse 4. When I kept silence, my bones wax old. He says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. And the moisture, my moisture was turned to draught. His, his tears had dried up. David was being judged by God. God's heavy hand of conviction was upon him. His own conscience was seared. As David said in Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. Uh, And so the first step to this path to contentment is allowing God, we don't allow God, but recognizing that God will chasten us, chastisement. When David sinned, he paid the price fourfold. And uh, uh, the soldier in David lost his strength. The singer in David lost his song. The saint in David lost his satisfaction, his joy. And uh, as we see these things. And so if you're a child of God, we need to understand that the path 
sometimes to spiritual contentment, the Lord has to put us through, uh, put us through a season of chastisement. <clears throat> and this is a sign that we truly are uh, sons of God and not illegitimate children, but we are by nature true children of God because as a father chastens his earthly son, so doth our heavenly father chasten those that are his. It involves chastisement. It also involves confession. David talks about that in verse 5. He says, I, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Notice that. I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Mine iniquity have I not hid. And <clears throat> David is now giving us a second step to the path of contentment is confession. Confession. And uh, now may I say, God already knew about it. We're not when we confess. We're not letting God in on something that He doesn't know about. God was very aware of of David's sin. God's very aware of your sin and my sin. But David confronted his sin. Uh, be careful of people who always want to go around pointing out the sins of others and confronting sins and other people, but not dealing with their own sin. And confession has starts first with you and with me. And uh, we might not be so judgmental on others if we can learn, first of all, to, uh, to not neglect the beam that's in our own eye, as the Scripture says. Judgment first begins in the house of God. David dealt with his own sin, his own iniquity, his own transgressions. He opened his heart to the Lord in transparency. And this is the path to contentment. It involves confession. And the Bible tells us if we confess our sin, as I've said, He is faithful. We're not faithful, but God is faithful to forgive. I'm glad for that. I'm thankful that when I fail the Lord in so many ways, when I yield to temptation, when I should have, when I should have stood strong, <clears throat> when there's a moment of weakness that I should have, have been a better Christian, I'm glad the Lord is faithful to forgive and His mercies and compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Not His mercy and compassion, but His mercies, plural, and His compassions, plural. And Jeremiah says in the book of Lamentations, they fail not, they are new every morning. God has more mercy than you have mistakes. He has more grace than you have guilt. And thank the Lord for His goodness. <clears throat> and so, then we see lastly the privileges of spiritual contentment. There are some privileges to those who possess contentment. <coughs> Look at verse 6 and 7. There's the privilege, and we need this one, the privilege of divine protection. Verse 6 and 7. For this shall everyone that is godly, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto thee. Look at verse 7. Thou art my hiding place, and thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Isn't that good to know? Uh, God has given us the privilege of divine protection. And when we walk in a place to where we are truly contented in Christ, there's safety there. There's, there's a refuge there to the, in the Lord. <clears throat> when we're close to the Lord in the times of temptation, in the times of trouble, in the times of trial, uh, we can find refuge. We can find divine protection. And then he talks about the privilege of divine preservation. Notice verse 7, the second part. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. Uh, songs of deliverance. Listen, we cannot escape. We cannot escape with the, the trials and temptations of this life. Uh, they will come now unto, unto us, no doubt about that. As we pass through life, none of us are exempt from trouble and temptation and trial. But we can have div divine preservation in the middle of our trouble and trial. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, said, uh, we're not bowing down to the king's decree. We're not dancing to the devil's music, and we're not bowing our head to idols. Our God will deliver us. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not bow. And even though they were faced with a great <clears throat> uh, 
a great sense of uh, a persecution. As the king said, if you refuse to do this, uh, there's a consequence to pay. You're going to burn. God could have kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. But, dear friend, he did something far greater than that. He went with them through the furnace. And God could have kept them from the fire, but he walked with them in the fire. The king came to the edge of the furnace and said, Did did we not cast in three men? Behold, I see four men loosed, and they're walking in the fire. There's freedom, and the fourth man is likened unto the Son of God. I'm saying to you this evening, there is divine preservation. In the middle of our troubles, God can preserve us. And then we see the privilege of divine uh, promises from God. <clears throat> His promises never fail us. You can read verses 8 and 9 and uh, through the rest of this chapter if you'd like to do so. And uh, there's divine praise. Let me just skip ahead real quickly. Well, I don't want to miss, look at verse 10, divine peace. Verse 10, many sh- sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Here's a great privilege, divine peace. Divine peace. I have books behind me here at home. I have several by Dr. Graham Scroggie. And uh, Brother Josh Barnes is sitting here with me in the office, and he has a master's degree from Crown College. And, and Dr. Scroggie's books are taught there in, on the master's level and some of his great books. And there's a wonderful analogy he gives in a book I found that uh, he says uh, this divine peace, it's, it's kind of like a, a man who's rebellious. He's a rebellious man. He describes a rebellious man, and he describes a contented man. A rebellious man is like a man who's, who's uh, surrounded by a swarm of angry hornets or wasps. Everywhere he turns, he's getting stung <laughs> because he's in rebellion. But the righteous man, he is also surrounded by a swarm, but not, not of wasps or hornets, but he's surrounded by a swarm of honeybees. And everywhere he turns, they're making honey for him. What a great analogy. And when we walk in rebellion as a Christian, we get stung. We face consequences every way we turn. But as we walk in contentment, <clears throat> those things that are hurtful to others, God will make them bread for us and honey for us as we see uh, <coughs> divine peace and And there's divine praise in verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. We see divine praise. That's a great privilege. And so think about spiritual contentment tonight. There's the possibility to have it. There's the path to find it. And there's the privileges to enjoy it. And I trust tonight that you truly will seek after the contentment that we find in Christ Jesus. May we bow in prayer. Lord, use the message you've given and this Bible study, this Wednesdays in the words, <clears throat> in the Word, to encourage and uplift the hearts of your people. Help all of us, including me, to, to be content in Christ, not to be complacent, not to be apathetic, but to know the difference between contentment and uh, not to be content with my own spiritual walk, not to have attained. Uh, Lord, I shouldn't be content with where I am spiritually. I should always be moving forward. But, Lord, to be content with your blessings and your provision that you've given and to know that you are enough. Our sufficiency is in Christ. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I'll sing one little verse, a little chorus that we all know, and we'll sign off with this. And I hope you know it. It says, learning to lean, learning to lean on Jesus. I'm learning to lean, learning to lean, I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dreamed, I'm learning to lean on Jesus. God bless you. Now, this coming Sunday, I want you to join us for our Mother's Day service, which will be right here on the parking lot. 
at uh, Victory Baptist Church at 11 o'clock. We're sending out a letter to all of our church family, an invitation in the mail. We're putting it on our Facebook. <clears throat> We're going to put it on this uh, broadcast tonight, something about that. But we do want you to join us at 11 o'clock for a drive-in parking lot service. We've asked the good friends of Slavic Baptist Church uh, and Pastor Dimitri Bellows to be a part of this service with us. I'll be saying a few words. He'll be saying a few words. We've got singers. Some ladies from his church will be singing. Some ladies from our church will be singing. It'll be a stirring time for for all of us as we celebrate Mother's Day at 11 o'clock. Join us, and you won't regret it. May the Lord bless you this week is our prayer.